Book Three, Chapter Twelve, Part Two, of Tasker Jevons: The Real Story by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book Three, His Book, Chapter Twelve, Part Two. I remember it because it was then that I laid before him my own problem. The Daily Post had asked me if I'd go out as its war correspondent. I was to wire yes or no in the next half hour, and if I went, I should have to start tonight. I said I didn't know what to do about it. He stared. You don't know what to do? I said no. It wasn't so simple when you had a wife and child dependent on you. I didn't know whether I ought to take the risk. And then he said his most memorable thing. If you can take the risk of living, my God, he said, if I only had your luck. His luck, I told him, was a dead certainty. There wasn't a paper that would refuse Tasker Jevons as war correspondent. He'd only got to volunteer. Why on earth, I asked him, didn't he? He became very grave. He seemed to be considering it. No, he said. No, that isn't quite good enough for me. I don't want to go out to the war to write about it. I want to do things. Perhaps, if there's no other way, I may be driven to it. For a moment, then, I suspected him. I doubted his sincerity. He was making all this fuss about enlisting to cover up his cowardice. He must have known all the time they wouldn't take him. He was safe. But put before him a thing he could do, do better than anybody else, a thing that would take him into the thick and keep him there if he wasn't killed, and he said, no, thank you, that wasn't quite good enough for him. I didn't believe in his perhaps if there was no other way he might be driven to it i saw him driven to do anything he didn't mean to do meanwhile he drove me before i had seen him i hadn't really meant to take that job he did something to me that changed my mind that was how i went out to belgium as a war correspondent i was out for a month then i was in ghent at the same old hotel in the place d'armes i got a touch of malaria and had to come home and the daily post sent another man out instead of me that was how i managed to see jevons in what nora called his second war phase he had been trying hard to get out with the red cross volunteers and it had been even funnier she said and more pathetic than his enlisting i don't know what viola thought of his war phases to nora they were just that funny and pathetic to the other thesigers he was purely offensive they resented jevons's trying to have anything to do with the war as if it had been some sort of impertinent interference with their prerogative his mother-in-law i know had no patience with him his frantic efforts to get to the front were nothing she declared but a form of war panic it took some people like that she said the only really cruel thing i had ever heard her say of him she said he looked panic-stricken he was lean and haggard by this time and had a haunted look which may have been what she meant and well if it wasn't panic that was the matter with him it was self-advertisement and if i'd any regard for him or any influence with him i'd stop it the little man was simply making himself ridiculous i was staying in canterbury with nora for the weekend and i heard all about it he did seem to have been rather funny he had begun with a scheme for taking out a red cross motor field ambulance which he proposed to command in person he had offered himself with his convoy first to the war office then to the admiralty then to the war office again and the war office and the admiralty kicked him out then he had gone round to each of the red cross societies in turn the american included and they had all got their own schemes for motor field ambulances and didn't want his what they did want was his subscriptions and his powerful pen to support their schemes and jevons had said damn my powerful pen to every one of them as for subscriptions he subscribed enormously to his own motor ambulance corps he had actually raised his unit found his volunteers his surgeons his chauffeurs and his stretcher bearers he had bought and equipped a motor ambulance car the one he had proposed to go with himself and they took his subscriptions and his ambulance car and his volunteers but they wouldn't take him no not at any price they put one of his surgeons at the head of the thing instead of him and sent it out without him and jimmy had to see it go but when they proposed that jimmy should use his powerful pen to maintain it in the field he swore that he would use it to expose the whole system and when he found that the responsibility for rejecting his services rested with the war office he went down to the war office and complained and to the admiralty and complained and to the home office and complained 
after that he seems to have visited all the embassies in turn the american the french the belgian and i suppose the russian and the japanese when i asked the thesigers what he was doing now they said they didn't know they hadn't heard of him and his activities for quite a fortnight and they didn't bother about him they were too much wrapped up in bertie and in reggie even if they hadn't been too busy every one of them up to their necks in work for the army or the hospitals they admitted that he had sent them large subscriptions it seemed to me as far as i could make out that viola hadn't seen or heard of him since she had left amershott she was too busy and too much wrapped up in reggie to bother about him either at least it looked like it she seems to have known in a vague way that he had talked about going to the front but i didn't believe she thought he would ever get there and he had lain low for a fortnight when we had got back to london at noon on tuesday which was the end of jimmy's fortnight i found a wire from amershott waiting for me it had been sent that morning it said leaving tomorrow must see you urgent business can you come down this evening jevons i knew that he wouldn't send a wire like that without good reason so i went a light rain was falling when i reached midhurst a hired dog-cart met me at the station so i gathered that jimmy's mad passion for his motor-car had survived the war and at amershott everything seems to have survived if it had not been for troops on the high road and for the stillness of the coverts and for the recruiting posters stuck everywhere on the barn doors and for the strange figure of old perrot driving the mail-cart from midhurst to amershott instead of his son you wouldn't have known that the war had anything to do with england and i expected to find jimmy in his old norfolk suit standing in the garage and looking with adoration at his motor-car as i thought all this i smiled when parker told me that mr jevons was in the garage parker i noticed didn't smile and in another minute it was jevons who did all the smiling i found him in the garage no i can't say i found him for i didn't recognize him but i heard his voice assuring me that it was he he was in khaki from head to foot from his peaked military cap to his puttees he was in faultless well-fitting khaki even his shirt and his necktie were khaki jimmy's colours showed up wonderfully out of all that brownish greyish yellowish green his flush fairly flamed and his eyes his eyes looked enormous and very bright great chunks of dark sapphire his eyes were they were twinkling at me it's me all right old man he said and turned from me in his deep preoccupation and as he turned i saw that he wore round his right arm a white brassard with a red cross on it at the far end of the coach-house where the great black and white idol used to stand there was a khaki car with a huge red cross on a white square on its flank and on its khaki canvas hood this was what his eyes turned to but where's the black and white god i asked there she is he said you're looking at her you haven't yes i have she's had her new coat on for the last three weeks you couldn't take her out as she was all black and white she'd have been knocked to bits before we'd begun our job so i had her painted she's a good enough target for shell-fire as she is you don't mean i said that you're going out what else have i been meaning ever since there was a war but where are you going to belgium he said he added that it was the only blessed place he could get to and what are you going to do when you get there he said he was going to scout for wounded of course and as he saw me still incredulous he told me how he'd managed it he'd gone every day for three weeks to the belgian legation and worried the belgian minister into a state of nervous prostration and when the minister was at his worst and was obliged to leave things a bit to his secretaries he'd gone to the secretaries and worried them till the first secretary had given him his passport and a letter of introduction to the president of the belgian red cross society at ghent and he had gone to ghent went there last week and he had seen the president and talked to him he had talked for ten minutes before his services had been accepted by the belgian red cross and he was going out to-morrow it's just taken me six weeks to do it i gave myself six weeks of course i congratulated him but i couldn't realize it the whole thing seemed incredible jevons in his khaki was incredible the transformed motor-car was incredible as a thing that jevons was concerned with above all it was incredible that he should have sacrificed his god i couldn't believe it until kendall the chauffeur turned up also in khaki and with a red cross brassard on his right arm kendall was credible enough he looked as if he had been going to the war all his life it was evident that he was keen on the adventure 
it was also evident that he adored jevons more than ever by watching kendal in the act of adoration and keeping my eyes fixed on him i was able to take it in and to assent to the statement that jevons was going to the war he was of course if kendal said so kendal was asking me what i thought of the car she's not the beauty she was sir said kendal i don't suppose mr jevons will care much how he knocks her about now and they do say the belgium roads is fair destruction to cars i said they were i'd motored on them kendal looked at me as he might have looked at the survivor of a shattering experience then he looked at his car he seemed to be seeing all the roads in belgium in a hideous vision then he spoke well they may be bad roads but mr jevons isn't going to be done he'll take out ten cars before he turns back ten cars he will yes yes i might have known it was there ever anything jevons had made up his mind to do and didn't had i ever known him turn back from any adventure that he had set out on if he said he was going to the war why couldn't i have known that he would go the more incredible the thing was the more likely he was to do it when i said so he shook his head and said it wasn't really as likely as it looked we were sitting together after dinner in his garden though it was the third week in september the nights were still warm without viola the stillness of the place was strange to me almost uncanny as if viola were dead and had come back and was listening to us somewhere i had just told him it was splendid of him going out like this and he had smiled back at me and asked like what and then i had said i might have known it it was the sort of thing he would do no he went on it wasn't likely it had been touch and go he had only just pulled it off by the skin of his teeth it had given him more trouble than anything he'd ever tried for it had bothered him more it had bothered him most damnably i thought he was referring to his struggles with the recruiting depots and the war office and the home office and the embassies and all the rest of it and i said it was pretty hard luck his own ambulance corps being sent out without him but he said no it wasn't he hadn't been very keen on the ambulance corps he hadn't really wanted to go out with all that beastly crowd this quick scouting game by himself was more in his line all he regretted was the time he'd lost well i said anyhow he was a lucky beggar to have got what he wanted after six weeks at that he looked at me suddenly and his face went all sharp and thin or else i hadn't noticed till then how sharp and thin it was his flush had seemed to flood it and fill it out somehow and his eyes struck your attention like two great flashes of energy the flash had gone out now as he looked at me i reminded him haven't you always said you could get what you wanted oh yes i've said it and i've done it that's nothing any fool can do that the great thing is to make yourself get what you don't want i didn't want to do this i had to no you wanted to enlist but i'm not sure that from your point of view this isn't better jolly lot you know he said about my point of view your idea i explained of doing things on your own isn't that what you wanted he answered very slowly i don't think it matters what i wanted or what i didn't want it's enough isn't it if i want to now if i want it more than anything else i said no i didn't think it did matter but i hadn't a notion what he meant i didn't know that he was on the edge of a confession i couldn't see that he was trying to tell me something about himself and that i had started him off by telling him he was splendid it was as if then he too had felt that viola was there and listening to us as if he were speaking to her and not to me for the next thing he said was i want you to tell viola about it tell her it's all right tell her i'm all right see but shan't you i said be seeing her isn't she going to see you off or something he said no much better not she wouldn't be content with seeing me off she'd try to come out with me she'd worry me to take her and i'm not going to take her she isn't to know i'm going till i've gone and she isn't to know where i've gone to i won't have her coming out to me you've got to see to that fernie you've got to stop her if she tries to get out they're all trying you should just see the bitches tumbling and wriggling and scrabbling with their claws and crawling on their stomachs to get to the front tearing each other's eyes out to get there first and there are fellows that'll take them they'll even take their wives not me not much i wouldn't let viola cross in the same boat with that lot it ought to be a put a stop to the place i'm going the things i'm going to see and to do aren't fit for women aren't fit for women to come within ten miles of whatever you do fernie and i don't care what you do you're not to let her get out 
i suppose i suppose i made him some sort of promise he says i did i don't remember i do remember telling him i thought it was a pity if he meant to go out that he hadn't seen viola all this time and i remember his answer i haven't seen her all this time because i meant to go out i meant that nothing on this earth should stop me how do you know i said that she'd have stopped you how do i know how do i know anything it's you who don't know you don't know anything at all well he went like that without telling any of them i ran down on the car with him to folkestone and saw him off in the boat to ostend he and kendall his chauffeur he as he pointed out to me superior to kendall only in the perfect fitting of his khaki otherwise there isn't a pin to choose between us except he said that kendall doesn't funk it and i do and with kendall grinning from ear to ear over mr jevons's delicious joke and jimmy waving his khaki cap in a final valediction and kendall's grin dying abruptly as he achieved the military salute he judged appropriate we parted jimmy's last words to me thrown over the gunwale were don't run after me ferny you won't catch me this time End of Book 3, Chapter 12 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Book 3, Chapter 13, Part 1 Of Tasker Jevons, The Real Story By May Sinclair This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Book 3, His Book Chapter Thirteen, Part One. Then I went back and told Viola about it. I took her into my library that had once been Jevons's study, where he had delivered the grand attack. I gave her a letter that Jevons had scribbled before lunch in the hotel at Folkestone. I suppose he had explained things in it. But as for me, or any power I had to break it to her, I might just as well have told her that he was dead, except that perhaps then she wouldn't have turned on me you knew this she said you knew he was going and you never told me i said i had only known it last night how could i have told her she persisted you knew at what time last night i hesitated and she drove it home you might have wired it wasn't too late i said it was and that i didn't know that she didn't know till it was too late to wire do you suppose she said if i'd known that i should be here I couldn't tell her she was so white under her wound and the shock of it. I couldn't tell her that she had given me no reason to suppose that she would be with him. And she went on. Why couldn't you have wired in the morning then? I could have caught that boat. Because, my dear girl, he doesn't want you to go out. It doesn't matter what he wants or thinks he wants. I'm going. And what's more, she said, you've got to take me. That's all you've gained by trying to stop me i replied that nothing would induce me to take her out that i'd promised jimmy she shouldn't go she said that didn't matter jimmy'd know i couldn't keep a silly promise like that and if i wouldn't take her she'd simply go by herself i tried to explain to her very gently that her going at all was out of the question she would do no good to anybody by going she would annoy jimmy most frightfully untrained women were not wanted at the front untrained she'd got her certificate three days ago what did i suppose she had wanted it for if it wasn't to go out with jimmy if he went you knew he was going then i said i knew he wanted to go but i didn't think he'd go so soon i didn't really think he'd go at all they told me i needn't worry that he hadn't a chance who told you oh everybody the general and colonel braithwaite and charlie and bertie and reggie at least he told nora and the people at the war office and the admiralty and the embassies you went to them you went to the war office i went everywhere where he did or as near as i could get and they all told me the same thing he hadn't a chance not the ghost of a chance i really thought he hadn't when you think of the men men who can do things who are dying to go and are being kept back you were helping him to go i said i saw a vision or i tried to see it a pathetic vision of viola following poor jimmy in his pursuit of secretaries and ambassadors doing insane impossible things to help him and then i saw viola herself she was looking at me with all her features tilted in that funny way she had well no she said i wasn't exactly helping what were you doing then 
I'm afraid I was trying to stop him." The sheer folly of it took my breath away. " Surely," I said, " if he hadn't the ghost of a chance, it wasn't necessary." " Well it was necessary, you see. He's so awfully clever. He was very nearly off once or twice. Only we just managed to get in in time." " Who got in in time ?"" Oh, it wasn't only me, Furny. It was all of us. We were all out trying to stop him Charlie and Reggie and Uncle Billy. He pulled all the ropes. We couldn't do much." " But what what did General Thesiger do ?"" He didn't do anything. He hadn't got to. He just said things. Told them about Jimmy." I don't know whether my face expressed horror or admiration. It must have been a sort of horror, for she began to excuse herself. " Why not ? Why should poor little Jimmy go ?"" Because he wants to. You'd no business to stop him when he wanted to go." " But that was it. He didn't want to go. He only thought he ought to go." " How," I said sternly, " do you know what he wanted ?"" Because," she said, " he told Uncle Billy. He kept on saying he ought to go, and we told him he oughtn't. What earthly good can Jimmy do out there with his poor little heart all dicky ? He'll simply die of it. You don't suppose I'd have stopped him if I'd thought it was good for him to go or if I'd thought he really wanted to. We told him all that. Uncle Billy and I did. We told him straight that if he tried to get out, we'd try and stop him." " Oh," I said, " you told him. That's a different thing." " Things, Furny, always are different to what you think them. At least they're never half so nasty. Of course we told him. And of course he laughed in our faces. We thought we had stopped him, but he slipped through our fingers. We might, she said, have known. I heard her say all that, though I wasn't listening. It comes back to me that she said it. It was dawning on me that in this queer business there were details, quite important details, that had escaped me. The war had taken up my attention to the exclusion of Viola's affairs. But it was evident that things had happened while I was away. I was thinking of something that she let out. " Look here," I said. " When you say you told him, do you mean that you and he have been seeing each other? "" Of course we've been seeing each other. Until he stopped it. He said he couldn't stand the strain. " And you," I said, " did you stand it? " She looked at me straight and hard. " You've no right to ask me that," she said. " Well, perhaps I didn't. And if I had owned frankly that I hadn't, all might have been well. But as it was, before I knew where we both were, we had quarreled. Yes, I quarreled with Viola, or she quarreled with me. It really doesn't matter how you put it. And it shows the awful tension we must have been living in. When I heard her say that I had no right to ask her that question, I answered that I thought I had. She said, what right? And I said if she would think a little, she would see what right. And at that she fired up and the blaze was awful. We two were up there alone and she had me at her mercy. She held me in the blaze. I suppose, she said, I'm to think of your everlasting meddling with my affairs. I pointed out that a charge of meddling came rather oddly from a lady who honored me by staying in my house because she preferred it to her husband's. You know perfectly well why I'm staying in your house, and if you don't, Nora does. I could have stayed with my father for that matter. I said I thought that that was extremely doubtful in the circumstances. I had her there, and she knew it, for she retired in bad order on an irrelevant point. She said I was no judge of the circumstances. I said peaceably that perhaps I wasn't, but that she must own that I had behaved as if I were. At any rate, I'd given her the benefit of the doubt. She said, you talk as if I'd been through the divorce court. Perhaps that's where you think I ought to be. The benefit of the doubt. You certainly have given it me. It's been nothing but doubt with you, Walter, ever since I knew you. You always thought awful things about me. I know you have. I could see you thinking them. You thought vile things about me and vile things about Jimmy. You came rushing out to Belgium because you thought them. And the other day you thought the same thing of me and Charlie Thesiger, and you came rushing after me again and giving me away and behaving so that everybody else would think me awful too. My dear child, you owned yourself that Charlie... Oh, Charlie, as if he mattered. He was only being an ass. The war upset him or something. I don't care what you think about Charlie, he doesn't either, but why you should go out of your way to think me awful... I said, I thought we'd done with that. No, she said, we haven't done with it. I want to get to the bottom of it. 
What makes you do these things? I believe you want to make out that I'm horrid, just as you wanted to make out that poor little Jimmy was when I went to him in Bruges. She went on. I can understand that because I did go to him, and I, I cared for him and you didn't like it. I can even understand your wanting me to be horrid then, because it made it easier for you. I had the sense to see that that was all that was the matter with you then, so I didn't mind. But why on earth you should keep it up like this? What can it matter to you now whether I'm nice or horrid? She had rushed on, carried away by her own passion, without seeing where she was going. I don't think she had seen, any more than I had, that for nine years I had been living behind a screen. A screen that had hidden me from myself. I don't think she saw even now when she came crashing into it. It was I who saw. The thing was down about my ears, and it wasn't the violence of its fall that terrified me. It was my own nakedness. I wasn't prepared to find myself morally undressed. I turned away from her. I began fiddling with my pens and papers. I trailed long slip-proofs under her eyes, pretending that I had work to do. But she saw through my pretenses, and her voice followed me. It was softer, though. It seemed to be pleading, as if she knew nothing about me and my screen. What harm did I ever do you, or poor Jimmy, either? I didn't let you marry me. You ought to be grateful to Jimmy. At least he saved you from that. I said I thought we needn't drag her husband into it, and I haven't a notion what I meant. I had to say something, and if it sounded disagreeable, so much the better. And she said there I was again, thinking that I had to remind her that Jimmy was her husband. You certainly seem to have forgotten it, I said. He knows how much I've forgotten. With that last word, she left me. I tried hard to shake the horror of it off. I remember I sat down to my proofs, and I suppose I tried to correct them. But all the time I heard Viola's voice saying, I can understand your wanting me to be horrid then, because it made it easier for you. But why on earth you should keep it up like this? What can it matter to you now whether I'm nice or horrid? It went on in my head till the words ceased to have any meaning. I had only a dreadful sense that I should remember them tomorrow, and that perhaps when tomorrow came I should know what they meant. And when tomorrow came, the war took up my attention again so that I actually forgot that Viola had said she was going out to it. She had let the subject drop abruptly. She didn't even refer to it when my friend, the editor of the Morning Standard, rang me up the next day to ask me if I'd go out to Belgium as their special correspondent. He was charmingly frank about it. He told me that it was Tasker Jevons he wanted, and Tasker Jevons he had asked to go. But since he couldn't get him, and his powerful pen, why then he'd had to fall back on me jevons he said had let him down pretty badly he'd understood from jevons that he was prepared to go for them at twelve hours notice and he'd given him twenty-four hours and he'd found that he'd gone out there two days ago chuck them my friend the editor supposed for another paper could i at twenty-three hours notice take his place i said i could and i would and i put him right about jevons and then i went to see about my motor-car it was when Viola began to bother me about her passport that the fight began. First of all, she asked me what I was doing about a motor car. I told her she needn't worry herself about my motor car. It wasn't any concern of hers. She grinned at that and said, all right. What she really wanted was to consult me about her passport. And when I refused to be consulted about her passport, to hear a word about her passport or about her going, she walked straight out of the house into a passing taxi that took her to the Belgian legation, where she saw that weak-minded secretary that Jevons had handled. And she came back in time for tea, very cheerful, and dressed in a sort of khaki uniform she had ordered, with a tunic and knee-breeches and puttees and a red cross brassard on her right arm. She said it had been a very tight squeeze, but she'd worked it down to her uniform, and it was all right. And if I'd had any difficulty with my motor people, I had had awful difficulty, but how she knew it I haven't to this day found out. Sometimes I think she'd worked that too. She knew the firm, and she wasn't Mrs. Tasker Jevons for nothing. If I'd had any difficulty, she could put that straight for me. She'd got her car, Jimmy'd ordered it for Amershot and forgotten about it, and her chauffeur, and I could go in it with her if I liked. It was a better car than the one I'd had in Belgium before, or, she said significantly, than the one I was going to take out with me. 
it was true that I didn't know anything about cars. Then Nora, my wife, stood up beside her sister, flagrantly partisan, and said, Couldn't I see it wasn't any use trying to stop her? She had me at every point. If I wouldn't take her, she'd go by herself with the chauffeur. And when I said, How about my promises, my word of honor? Viola laughed. Your honor's all right, Wally, she said. You're not taking me out, I'm taking you. And very early in the morning, we motored down to Folkestone to catch the midday boat for Ostend and nora came with us to see us off if i'd given her the smallest encouragement she'd have come too i might take her she said it was beastly being left behind i said like a savage that belgium was no place for women i'd take my sister-in-law there but not my wife i suppose the dressing down i'd got from viola two nights before had rankled i must have felt that i was getting my own back that time when i threw it up to her that she wasn't my wife nora i said had too much sense to want to go where she wasn't wanted but viola only laughed again and said please remember that i'm taking you not you me and nora wants to go as much as i do and it isn't altogether on your account you needn't think it as for keeping her back you couldn't do it if she meant to go it's baby that's keeping her not you and then she thanked god she hadn't got a child and so sparring and chaffing by turns half in play and half in earnest for a secret subterranean anger smouldered still in both of us we got off i remember at the last moment nora dear little nora telling her that she was not to bully me she was to let me sit in the motor-car as much as i liked and she was to see that i didn't get into any danger 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 as the great fans of the screws churned the harbour water into foam that the waves thinned and flattened out again till the green lane broadened between our track and the pierhead where nora stood and the little slender dark blue figure became a dot on the pier and lost itself in the crowd of dots and disappeared then for the first time it struck me that to be going off like this alone with viola was danger in itself because the other night she had made me see myself as i really was a man not of an irreproachable rectitude an immaculate purity had i ever had anybody ever really supposed that i was such a man but quite deplorably human and blind yes my dear viola blind as any bat and vulnerable so vulnerable that i think you might have spared me you might have had some pity i found myself addressing her like that in my heart as i walked up and down up and down the deck not looking at her but acutely aware of her where she sat in her deck chair bundled up in her great khaki motor coat and in the rugs i had wrapped round her i resented the power she had over me to make me aware of her at such a time or at any time for that matter here was i a special correspondent going out to the war and there on the other side of the channel was the war in the fields of france and of flanders men were fighting men were slaughtering each other every day by thousands i was a man and i should have been thinking of those men and here i was compelled against my conscience and my will to think of this woman she had come out with me against my conscience and my will and against my judgment and my good taste and my honour and my common sense against everything in me that i set most store by i hadn't meant to take her with me and she had made me take her and when my common sense told me that she hadn't that i wasn't taking her and that she had as much right to be on the ostend boat as i had i still resented her being there I still raged as I realized the power she had over me. She had always had it. She had had it the first day I ever saw her, when she had walked into my rooms against my orders, half an hour behind the time I had appointed, and had made herself my secretary against my will. She had had it when she used me as a stalking horse to draw her brother's suspicions away from her in Jevons. She had had it when she drew me after her to Belgium, and when I followed her from Bruges to Canterbury at her bidding she had had it when i married nora hadn't she told me in the insolence of it that she had meant that i should marry nora she had had it this malign power over me the other night and she had it now she always would have it it wasn't my fault i told myself if she compelled me to look at her this time as i passed her deck chair i looked at her and she sent me a little sad interrogative smile that asked me why i walked the decks thus savagely and alone and i paid no attention to her or to her smile in the very arrogance of isolation i continued to walk the decks 
I meant her to see that I could be alone and savage if I liked. And when I looked at her again, she couldn't have made me this time, for she was unaware of me, lost in some profound meditation of her own. When I looked at her again, my anger and my resentment died with a sort of struggle and a pang. She had, after all, the grace of her ignorance and innocence. If she had had no pity on me, it was because she was as blind as she had said I was. She didn't, she couldn't see me, as she had made me see myself. She didn't know that she had any power over me, or else she wouldn't have used her power. She was too honorable for that, too chivalrous. You could trust her to play the game until she threw it up and left it. And I passed again in my sullen tramping, and I looked at her for the third time, urged by the remorse that stung me. And this time she drew me so that I went over to her and sat by her. I looked at my watch. We had been two hours on board. I had left her two hours alone, and in those two hours she had suffered. Her face was set now in a sort of brooding fear and anguish. Her breathing had a tremor in it, as if her heart dragged at her side. It was better, far better, that we should quarrel than she should suffer and sit quivering in silence and see frightful things. But I saw that she wasn't going to quarrel. She wasn't going to pitch into me. She wasn't going to assert herself and domineer over me just now. This agony of hers had made her gentle, so that she spoke to me as if she were sorry for me after all. Are you tired, she said, of tramping up and down? Horribly tired. Put my rug round you if you're going to sit still. Nora wouldn't let you sit still without a rug. Nora wouldn't let me do anything I shouldn't do. She smiled down at me, still sad, but with the least little flicker of irony in the top of her sadness. Nora's job isn't very hard. You don't ever want to do anything you shouldn't. Oh, don't I? No, never. That's the pull you have over naughty people like me. You're so good. It wasn't my goodness you were rubbing into me the other night. Never mind the other night. It doesn't matter what I said the other night. Only what I'm saying now this minute has any importance. But it was your goodness if it comes to that. Queer sort of goodness. I was still, you see, a little stung. All goodness, she said, is queer, carried to that pitch. But you're a dear in spite of it. I won't bully you. We made the last part of the crossing on the highway of the sunset. The propeller lashed through crimson and fiery copper, and the white wake tossed on to the highway turned to rose and gold and its edges to purple. I had left her again, and I called to her to look at this wonder of the sky and sea, but she shook her head at me. There was no need to call her. She had looked. I could see by her eyes that the intolerable beauty had brought Jevons back to her. He was there for her in all beauty and in all wonder. Then she called to me. Wally, come here. I want to speak to you. I came. You thought I was going to leave Jimmy, but I wasn't. He knew I wasn't. Why, the very first night I knew how impossible it was. I said, yes, of course it was impossible, and of course he knew. I shan't mind if only we can get to him before anything happens. I said nothing would happen, and of course we should get to him. She was silent so long that I was startled when she said, Wally, your nerves aren't you, are they? I said, no, no, of course they weren't. I knew what she was thinking. Out of the intolerable beauty, she had seen Jimmy rise with all his gestures. She heard the cracking of his knuckles and saw the jerking of his thumb. And these things became tender and pathetic and dear to her, as if he were dead. And she had seen herself shudder at them, as if it had been another woman who shuddered, a strange and pitiless woman whom she hated. It wouldn't matter so much if he had wanted to go, she said. Why do you keep on saying that he didn't want to go? because he said so. He said he was only going because he couldn't not go. I think you're doing him a great injustice. He told me he wanted to go. I've no doubt he did want to go, just like any other man. Yes, to be just like any other man. That's what he wanted. But he couldn't be. He isn't like any other man, and so it's worse for him. Can't you see that it's worse for him? It'll hurt him more. I said I didn't see it and that she was absurd and morbid and utterly unreasonable, and that she was making Jimmy out unreasonable and morbid and absurd. She told me then I didn't understand either of them, and we were silent, as if we had quarreled again, until we came in sight of the Flemish coast. End of Book 3, Chapter 13, Part 1 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine
Book three, chapter thirteen, part two of Tasker Jevons, the real story by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book three, his book, chapter thirteen, part two. We sailed into Ostend on the tail end of the sunset. What was left of it was enough to keep up for us the intense moment of transfiguration so that we didn't miss it the long white deeg the towers the domes of the casinos and hotels the high flat fronts of the houses showed soaked in light quivering with light ostend might have been some enchanted eastern city it was as if the heroic land faced us with the illusion of enchantment to cover the desolation that lay beyond her dykes and we who looked at it were still silent not now as if we had quarrelled but as if this beauty had made peace between us viola's face had changed it reminded me in the oddest way of her brother reggie's i think that for the moment while it lasted she had forgotten jimmy she had forgotten her brother reggie she had touched the fringe of the immensity that had drawn them from her and swallowed them up and in forgetting them she had forgotten her unhappy self in ostend at any rate i was to have no more of her brooding we had no sooner landed than she became the adorable creature who had run away with jevons nine years ago and led me that dance through the cities of flanders she showed me the same whole-hearted devotion to the adventure the same innocence the same tact in ignoring my state of mind she seemed to be making terms with me as she had made them then suggesting that if i would ignore a few things i should find her the most delightful companion in my travels we must she seemed to say of course forget everything that she had said to me the other night or that i had said to her before or since and as she swung beside me in her khaki her freedom and her freshness declared how admirably she had forgotten it wasn't as if we didn't know what we were really out for except that she was a maturer person thirty-one and not twenty-two i might have mistaken her for viola thesiger my secretary setting out in defiance of all conventions with little jevons to look for belfries in belgium and taking the war since there was a war on in her stride and as i walked with her through the same streets where nine years ago i had hunted for her and jevons it struck me as a strange unsettling thing that i should be taking her out to look for jevons and at the same time playing precisely jevons's part in the adventure she too must have been aware of this oddness for she stopped suddenly to say to me do you remember when i ran away with jimmy isn't it funny that i should be running away with you i said it was very funny indeed and i wondered why she had drawn my attention to it just now does she want to make me judge by the transparent innocence of this running the not quite so transparent innocence of that i think so remember it was reggie thesiger's apparent doubt as to her innocence that had been at the bottom of all the trouble of the last five years it accounted for attack on me the other night it was as if she had turned to say to me triumphantly now perhaps when i'm running away with your precious perfection at last you understand we had some difficulty in finding quarters and viola insisted on our staying in the station hotel which had been bombarded by an aeroplane the night before she pointed out that it was almost entirely empty and so she said there won't be anybody to see us it was as if she wished to remind me by how thin a thread my reputation hung the business of our passports kept us in ostend the next morning i had made up my mind there would be difficulty about viola's military pass i was even contemplating the possibility of her being sent back to england by the next boat but no she had forestalled obstruction and the pocket of her khaki coat was stuffed with letters from the war office the british red cross and the french and belgian embassies in fact there was one horrid moment at the depot when it looked as if the special correspondent would be smuggled through under viola's protection you see ferny she said nobody's going to stop me nobody wants to stop me at last we got off and early in the afternoon we were in bruges we had run into the market-place before we knew where we were and yonder in the street at the back of it was viola's pension and here on her right hand was jimmy's hotel and there towering before us was the belfry we looked at each other and through the war and across nine years it all came back to us the belfry's still there i said it always was she said it a little sternly 
but she had smiled at the illusion all the same the smile that had never been denied to it we stayed an hour in bruges and lunched there in jimmy's hotel the fat proprietor and his wife were still there and they remembered us they remembered jimmy and they had seen him three days ago mr chevons had passed through bruges in his red cross motor car they seemed uncertain whether viola was mrs chevons or mrs furnival and they addressed her indifferently as either an awful indifference had come to them of the war they said c'est triste n'est-ce pas we left them sitting pallid and depressed behind the barricade of their bureau gazing after us with the saddest of smiles that hour in bruges was a mistake so was our lunching at jimmy's hotel it was too much for viola it brought jimmy so horribly near to her i don't know what she was thinking but i am convinced that from the moment of our entering bruges the poor child had made up her mind that jimmy had been killed the smile she had given to the belfry was the last flicker of her self-control and halfway through lunch the grey melancholy that bruges had absorbed from jimmy nine years ago came down on her as nine years ago it had come down on me and it swallowed her up by the time the waiter brought the coffee she was done for her eyes stared hard and hot over the cup she tried to drink from she couldn't drink because of the spasm in her throat come i said we must clear out of this we cleared out i too was invaded by the grey melancholy as we came to the bridge by the eastern gate where i had found jevons that night leaning over and looking into the canal it was the sentry's sudden springing up to challenge us that saved me i hoped that it would save viola she enjoyed the sentries but not this time her nerves were all on edge and she showed some irritation at the delay i felt then that i had to take her in hand my dear child i said we were running out on the road to ghent now do you realize that there's a war she answered yes wally yes i know there is do you know that antwerp's over there a little way to the north and that they've dragged up the big guns from namur for the siege of antwerp oh wally have they she turned her face to the north as if she thought she could see or hear the siege guns but you said jimmy was in ghent jimmy i said is probably in ghent if he isn't he's in antwerp do you know that the battlefields are down there no there to the south where i'm pointing there's fighting going on there now she said yes dear i know i know very gently and she put her hand on my knee as if she recognized the war as my private tragedy and was sorry for me then she fell back to her brooding somewhere on the great flagged road between bruges and Eclou, we met a straggling train of refugees old men and women and children bent double under their enormous bundles making for bruges and ostend they stared not at us but at the road in front of them with a dreadful apathy as we passed this i said is what finishes me every time i see it she said nothing do you realize i said that those women and those little children are flying for their lives that they've come doubled up like that for miles from termon or allo that they've lost everything they ever had i can hear my own voice beating out the horror of it in hard cruel jerks that their homes their homes are burned to ashes somewhere down there at my last jerk she turned no she said i'm cold and hard and stupid and i do not realize it neither do you if either of us realized it for two seconds we should be either cutting our throats in that ditch or going back to ostend now with a load of those women and children instead of tearing past them like devils in this damned car i can't realize anything till i know whether jimmy's all right or not i can't see anything or feel anything or think of anything but jimmy bruges is jimmy and belgium is jimmy and the whole war is jimmy to me i don't care if you are horrified i can't help it if i am callous it is so and you can't make it different i remember saying quite abjectly that i was sorry that i was only trying to turn her mind to other things as a relief i'm to turn my mind to that as a relief she showed me a woman i was trying not to see a woman who carried the bedding of her household on her back and dragged a four-year-old child by the hand the child slipped to its knees at every other yard and at every other yard was pulled up whimpering and dragged again not with anger or any emotion whatever but with a sickening repetition as if its mother's arm was a mechanism set going to pull and drag if ever there was a weathercock it was my sister-in-law 
without even pretending to consult me she made colville the chauffeur turn the car round he was her chauffeur after all she said i don't know she said whether i realize that woman or not or whether you do but i'm going to take her into bruges and we took her viola nursed the four-year-old child all the way we also took an old man and a young woman with a baby at her breast and two small children it was the only thing to be done viola said it was nearly half past five when we left bruges the second time god only knows i groaned what time we'll get to ghent he does she said he knows perfectly well we shall get there by half past seven and we did it was dark when we turned into the place d'armes and drew up before the long grey hotel de la poste i jumped out and stood by the curb to give viola my hand but she said i know this place you ought to i don't know where she expected us to go she still sat in the car as if held there by the shock of recognition she ignored my outstretched hand you'd better take your things she said at last if you want to get out here i'm going on to look for jimmy i had then my first full sense of what i was in for i saw that she was perfectly prepared to throw me over to dump me down here or anywhere else and go on by herself with the car and the chauffeur that were or ought to have been mine she didn't care if i was special correspondent to the morning standard and she had that beastly chauffeur in her pocket all the time i discovered afterwards that she'd laid in food for him and hidden it in the locker under the front seat so that they might be ready for any sort of adventure and yet in the very moment that i realized her disastrous obstinacy i found her intolerably pathetic if you want to look for jimmy i said you'd better get out too he'll be here if he's anywhere in ghent but she was already on the curb brushing me aside she had seen behind my back the approach of the concierge and she made for him is mr jevons in this hotel mr tasker jevons yes mr chevons was in the hotel madame would find him in the lounge she had swept past him to the stair of the lounge and i was following her discreetly when the proprietor dashed out of his bureau to intercept us the lounge he said was reserved from seven till nine o'clock for the officers of the general staff viola had paid no attention to the proprietor and was sweeping up the stair i gave jevons's name and explained that the lady was mrs jevons the proprietor a portly and pompous belgian positively dissolved in smiles and bows and apologetic gestures me pardon monsieur me pardon it would be all right monsieur chevens was dining with the officers of the general staff he did not know that madame was expected he was to reserve a room for monsieur i told him to reserve rooms for me and the chauffeur and to consult mr jevons about madame and i hurried up the stair after viola she was waiting for me at the turn on the landing by the wide archway of the lounge where the great glass screen began that shut off the staircase she stood back from the entrance looking in and smiling at what she saw it was clear by her attitude and her absorption that something was happening in there as i approached she made a sign to me and withdrew farther back and up the stair he's there she whispered over there in that corner for a moment we stood together on the stair looking down through the glass screen into the lounge the far end of the lounge had been turned into a dining place for the officers of the belgian general staff most of the tables were cleared now and deserted but from our place on the stair we had a clear view slantwise of one small table in the corner and we saw jimmy seated at that table at least we made him out all but jimmy's head was hidden by the figures of a belgian general and two colonels they had closed in on him they were evidently all four at the end of their dinner they had closed in on him in an access of emotion and enthusiasm the general the one who sat beside him had his arm round jimmy's shoulder the two who sat facing him leaned towards jimmy over half the table and one grasped jimmy's right hand in his the other was making some sort of competitive demonstration the disengaged arms of the three held up the glasses in which they were about to pledge him and at the other end of the room a scattered group of soldiers rose to their feet and looked on smiling and signalling applause what was happening down there was public homage to jimmy and in between the two dark belgian uniforms that obscured him you could just see a bit of jimmy's khaki and from among the white and grizzled heads that pressed on him you saw jimmy's face and jimmy's flush and jimmy's twinkle his incredible irrepressible twinkle 
You could even see the tips of Jimmy's little front teeth trying to bite down his lip into some sort of composure. You could see that he was very shy and very modest. You could see that in spite of his shyness and his modesty, he was frightfully pleased. But more than anything, you could see that he was amused. Positively, positively, he had the air of not taking his Belgian officers very seriously. We mustn't go down yet, said Viola, or we'll spoil it. So we waited, looking at Jimmy through the screen, while the officers clinked their glasses and drank to him and called his name. And the group that looked on echoed it, and the waiters who had come in to see what was happening repeated among themselves, Vive l'Angleterre! Vive les Anglais! Vive Chevon! 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 I wonder, said Viola, what Jimmy has been up to. You can take me to him. When we got to the table, we found Jimmy trying to explain to the general and the two colonels in execrable French that he didn't know what it was all about. He hadn't done anything. Then he saw Viola. For one second, while he stared at her across the room, he appeared to be suffering from a violent shock. He was so visibly hit that the two men who had their backs to us turned round to see what it was that had affected him. His flush had gone suddenly, and he was breathing hard with his mouth a little open. I heard him saying something in French about his wife. He recovered, however, in a second, and disentangled himself from the general and the colonel's and from the dinner table and came forward. And as he came, I noticed something odd about him. He limped slightly. His khaki had a battered look. It was soiled and torn in places, and the Red Cross brassard on his sleeve was simply filthy. And he had only been out three days, mind you. He was only three days ahead of us, but he had lost no time. As they strolled up to each other and met midway in the big public room, in the fraction of time that had passed before their hands touched, I heard him draw a hard, quivering breath and let it out in a long sigh. That breath was a suppressed cry of trouble and of acquiescence. Then, I could have blessed him for it, he twinkled. Viola said, what have you been up to? And Jimmy, I say, I like that. What are you doing here? Have you come to look at the belfry? No, I've come to look at you. She put her hand on his shoulder. He said, that's a jolly rig out you've got and that was all. The general and the two colonels came forward and were presented to Mrs. Jevons, and Mr. Walter Furnival, one of our war correspondents, was presented to the general and the two colonels. They saluted Madame, they begged Madame to accept their profoundest congratulations, they regretted that Madame had not been present just now when they were drinking her husband's health, and the old general, the one with the white hair and imperial, informed her that monsieur her husband had a very poor opinion of the belgian army he has saved the lives of three belgian officers and i do not know how many belgian soldiers and he says that it is nothing and the stout florid colonel who had been trying to look young and rakish ever since he had turned and caught sight of viola suggested that perhaps if he had saved your british he would not have said that it was nothing and the lean iron-grey colonel with a ferocious moustache remarked in an austere guttural voice il est impayable lui jimmy had been offering cigarettes to them as if he thought that was the only thing that would stop them then the old white-haired general sat between viola and him with his arm round jimmy's shoulder and began again so loudly that everybody in the room could hear him your husband madame is a man who does not know what fear is who does not care what death is for two nights and three days, madame, he has been down there, at Allo and Termont, under shell-fire. Mais un enfin, madame, you would have thought he had been born under fire, your husband. Ce n'est pas un homme et un salamandre. Bullets, mitrailleuse, shrapnel, it is no more to him than to go out in a shower of rain. When our men were scuttling and shouted to him to get under shelter, what do you think he said? Ouvri un parapluie, ce ne vaut pas la peine. There was a shout of laughter. That, said Viola, is the sort of thing he would say. And please, I want to know what's the matter with his leg. I can see her now sitting on that crimson velvet seat in the lounge and looking past the gesticulations of the general to Jevons, who was shaking his head at her as much as to say, Don't you believe the old boy? He's a shocking storyteller. The old general seemed aware of her preoccupation, for he rose, murmuring affectionately, Un petit chevon. I will not praise him to you, madame. No doubt you know what he is. I can see her standing up there and giving her hand to the old general, 
and trying to stiffen her face to say i know evidently she thought general roubaix was too voluble to be entirely trustworthy for when he left us and jimmy had gone out to see about our dinner she addressed herself to the two colonels please tell me what my husband really did both the colonels tried to tell her but it was the younger one with the moustache the one who had said that jimmy was empoyable who satisfied her it was true every bit of it jevons it seemed had been in the thick of the bombardment of allo and in the fighting for the bridge at termont his practice was to leave kendall and the motor-car behind him in some place of shelter while he walked into the fire sometimes he took his belgian stretcher-bearers with him sometimes when they didn't like the look of it he went by himself he didn't care the colonel said where he went or how if it was through rifle fire or mitrailleuse he went on his hands and knees he wriggled on his stomach if it was shrapnel he took his chance he had saved one of his three officers by carrying him straight out of his own battery when the german guns had found its range and he had driven his car by himself across a five-mile long field under a hailstorm of shrapnel to get the other two you see the colonel expounded your husband has chosen the most dangerous of all field ambulance work those high-speed scouting cars running low on the ground can go where a big ambulance cannot it is magnificent what he has done when jevons came back they could still hardly keep their eyes off him they could hardly tear themselves away it was adamant monsieur and adamant colonel as if they had arranged another deadly tryst well said jimmy how do you like them oh they're dears said viola especially the one with the moustache do you know they've told me everything except what's the matter with your leg my leg said jimmy a bit of shell barked it i'm jolly glad it's my leg and not my hand i was a little frightened when viola left us alone after dinner i thought he would pitch into me for bringing her but he only said sadly you oughtn't to have brought her fernie but i suppose you couldn't stop her i said no i couldn't stop her but i hadn't brought her she had brought me we sat on till the lounge was open to the guests of the hotel and when the war correspondence began to drop in i saw that jevons was uneasy do you mind if i turn in old man he said i asked him if his wound was hurting him he stooped and caressed it pensively no he said not a bit i like my wound it it makes me feel manly presently he said good night and left me i thought yes i certainly thought that he exaggerated his limp a little as he crossed the room and for a moment i wondered is he playing up to the correspondence then i saw that viola stood in the doorway waiting for him and that she gave him her arm and then through the glass screen i saw them going together up the stair and i remembered the tale that he had told me nine years ago how he had seen her standing there and looking down at him half frightened through the glass screen and how he had said to me i couldn't she was so helpless somehow and so pretty that for the life of me i couldn't it was the same room and the same glass screen and the same stair and it was the same man i knew him i knew him i had always known him was there ever any risk he hadn't taken i had never really for one moment misunderstood i certainly knew why he liked his wound end of book three chapter thirteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine book three chapter fourteen part one of tasker jevons the real story by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine book three his book chapter fourteen part one we had breakfast very early the next morning for jevons was under orders to start at eight o'clock for termon we had a table reserved for us in a corner of the restaurant the hotel was full of belgian officers and i found i was infinitely better off in attaching myself to jevons than if i had joined the war correspondence viola i may say that her rig-out which jevons had admired so much the khaki tunic and breeches made us terribly conspicuous had come down in a contrite mood i heard her telling jevons that he must be kind to me for i had had an awful time with her and i had been an angel well i had had an awful time i don't think i remember ever having had a worse time than the hours i had spent in her company since she had laid into me on tuesday evening but i had not been an angel far from it 
looking back on those hours i can see that i behaved to her like a perfect brute she had her revenge one of those revenges that are the more triumphant because they are unpremeditated she had dished me as a war correspondent for i declare that from the moment when we found jevons and his general in the hotel i became the victim of her miserable point of view i could only see the war through jevons and as a part of jevons i might have said like viola that to me ghent was jevons and belgium was jevons and the war was jevons i suppose i saw as much of the war from first to last as any special correspondent at the front and i know that barring the siege of antwerp the three weeks when jimmy was in it were by no means the most important or the most thrilling weeks in the war and of the one event the siege of antwerp i didn't see as much as i ought to have seen being most terribly handicapped by viola and yet perhaps a little because of viola but infinitely more because of jevons those three weeks stand out in my memory before the battles of the Aisne and marne and the long fight for calais because of jevons i have made them figure in the columns of the morning standard and elsewhere with a superior vividness even now when i recall them i seem to have lived with jevons in flanders through long periods of time i have the proof of my obsession before me in a letter from the editor of the morning standard dated october the twelfth he says we are interested of course in anything relating to mr tasker jevons and his performances seem to have been remarkable you have written a very fine account of mele which i understand is a small village four and a half miles from ghent but there are other events the fall of antwerp for instance well we got the story of the fall of antwerp all right but jimmy wrote it for me it was the last thing he did write yes he had only three weeks of it all told he went out on tuesday september the twenty second and he came back to us on tuesday october the thirteenth it was his infernal luck that he should have had no more of it and yet i don't know i don't see how he could have held out much longer at his pitch of intensity three weeks would have been nothing to any other man but jevons could do more with three weeks than another man could do with a three years campaign and he contrived to crowd into his term the maximum of glory and of risk and when it was all over it was less as if fate had foiled him than as if he had given himself three weeks but jimmy was discontented and every morning at breakfast we listened to the most extraordinary lamentations his job he said wasn't at all the jolly thing it looked for he was under orders the whole blessed time he'd no more freedom hadn't jimmy than that poor devil of a waiter he'd got to go or to stay where a fussy old ram of a colonel sent him so here he was in ghent an open city when he wanted to be in antwerp he hadn't been anywhere anywhere at all as for what he'd done he couldn't see what the fuss was all about he hadn't done anything he'd seen a little fight in a turnip field and a little squabble for a bridge you could blow up to-day and build again to-morrow and a little tin-pot town peppered and look at the war just look at the war and when we tried to cheer him up with the prospect of a second waterloo the waterloo that all the war correspondents said was coming off next week he refused to listen to what he called our putrid gabble there wouldn't be any waterloo next week or the week after he said there won't be any waterloo for another two years if then he wasn't always lugubrious it was only when he thought that he was missing the siege of antwerp that his happiness was incomplete it was on our third morning when he rushed off joyously to cathrecht i think that i said to viola you thought it would hurt him more than other people you needn't have come out after him you see how much is hurting him i'm glad i came she said i don't mind as long as i can see do you remember him telling reggie that he wouldn't be in the war because he was a coward don't you wish reggie could see him now she didn't answer and i saw that there was still a sting for her in reggie's name the war might have made her forgive him but there were things that the war couldn't wipe out from her memory and there was her own rather appalling injustice to jimmy i wondered whether she was thinking of how she had tried to stop his going to the front and how she had said he didn't want to go but i had to own that she had done the best thing for her peace of mind by coming out my peace of mind i was told quite frankly didn't matter jevons though he admitted that i couldn't have stopped her coming out made me responsible for her presence at the seat of war the trouble was that she insisted on following him wherever he went and as it wasn't to be expected that he would take her with him into the tight places that he managed to get into in his own car 
I had to have her in mine. Not that Viola consented to my putting it that way. It was clear that she made herself mistress of the situation when she obtained possession of that car and manoeuvred, as I am sure she did manoeuvre, for my own failure with the firm that supplied it. On our first morning in Ghent we came to what she called an understanding, when she rubbed it well into me that it was her own car and her own chauffeur that she had brought out, and that the man was under her orders, not mine. If I liked to come with her, why, of course I could. Otherwise, I could go halves with one of the other correspondents in one of their cars. But she pointed out that I could hardly do better than come with her, for by simply following Jimmy, I should get nearer to the firing line than anybody else. She had assumed that the firing line was the goal of every war correspondent's ambition. I would find, she said, that it would work quite well. It did. It worked better than if I had gone halves with the other correspondent. For at this time, war correspondents were not greatly loved by the military authorities, and they were having considerable difficulty in getting near anything, and the time, Jimmy said, was coming when they would be cleared neck and crop out of Belgium my astute sister-in-law had calculated on this and on her own part in it if you'll only trust me wally she said the first day we started when all the correspondents in the hotel had turned out to see us off you'll find that i'm your providence and not your curse i can get you through where you'd never get yourself just look at those men how sick they are i said i thought it would be only decent to take two or three of them with us we had room but viola was firm she said it would be most indecent we should want all the room we had for our wounded. Do you suppose I'm going to shivvy Jimmy about without doing anything to help him? As for you, you've only to sit tight and do what you're told. You'll be all right as long as we follow Jimmy. And so we followed him. My God, what a chase! But Viola's little chauffeur was game, and we followed. Though Jimmy had made elaborate arrangements for stopping his wife's progress at least two miles outside the danger zone, she always managed to get through sentries colonels army medical officers she twisted them into coils round her little finger and cast them from her and got through and once through we were really quite useful in transporting wounded jevons and i between us managed to keep her out of the actual firing line by telling her she was in all of it there was and when we were loaded up with wounded there was no difficulty in getting her away and certainly it served my turn well enough though i was compelled to see the war through jimmy i saw the war by the end of our first week jimmy seemed to get used to being followed as a matter of course we had followed him to Allo and termont and cathrach and zelle when we weren't following him we were near him somewhere working at the dressing stations or among the refugees then he did a mean thing he managed to get himself sent to antwerp for three days he sneaked off there by himself on the sunday and when we tried to follow him we were turned back at st nicholas just too late to see the british go through he had worked it this time when he got back from antwerp at the end of his three days we knew that something had happened something that he was keeping from us it wasn't only the fate of antwerp that was hanging over him as it hung over all of us in that awful second week it was as if he had seen something intimate and terrible that he couldn't talk about that night after viola had gone to her room he told me what had happened he had seen Charlie Thesiger's regiment at St. Nicholas on Sunday, and today, which was Tuesday, he had seen Charlie Thesiger. He had found him lying dangerously wounded in the British hospital at Antwerp. That, he said, was what had kept him there, and he had brought him back with him to Ghent. He was in the Couvain de Saint-Pierre. He thought perhaps it would be better not to tell Viola just yet. Charlie didn't know, he said, that she was here. The war was beginning to close round us. The next day, Wednesday, he announced that he was going to Tsele, but he didn't, he really didn't want me to take Viola there. I could go by myself, of course, if I liked, though he didn't care about her being left. But we did go. Viola's blood was up after what she called Jimmy's meanness, and there was no keeping her back. We were a little uncertain of our way, for following Jimmy as we did, or rather following the direction Colville swore he had seen him start in, took us much too far to the north. We found ourselves on the Antwerp road, jammed in the traffic, and caught by a stream of refugees. We were obliged to turn back to Ghent to get our bearings, but the business of transporting women and children kept us on the Antwerp road all morning, and it was past two o'clock before we started for Zele. 
I remember this particular chase after Jimmy for many reasons. First, we lost our way and never got to Zele at all. Down in the southeast on the skyline, we saw a fleet of little clouds that seemed to be anchored to the earth, and every cloud of the fleet was a smoke from a burning village. West of the village was an enormous cloud blown by the wind across miles of sky. Viola was certain that the big cloud was Zele being burned to the ground, and that Jimmy would be burned with it. When I told her that it wasn't likely that Jimmy would stay in Zele when it was burning, she said that I didn't know Jimmy, and anyhow, it was there that she was going. Suddenly, Viola sat up very straight. Fernie, is that guns I hear, or thunder? I said it was guns. A deep and solemn booming came from before and behind us, and on either side, east and west. We had rushed bang between the French and German batteries. The big cloud turned out to be smoke from a factory that the Belgians had set fire to themselves, and in following it we had gone miles from Zele. Now we followed the guns. We turned east and struck off south, and found ourselves in the village of Bel Air. The lines of fire seemed suddenly to narrow in on us here. There was a clean path down the centre of the street, for men and horses stood back close under the house walls on each side. The place was full of soldiers. One of them told us that we could get to Zele by going east through the village, but as the road was being shelled, he didn't advise us to try. We went down that clean middle of the street. We were safe enough as long as we ran between the houses, but the village very soon came to an end, and then, in the open road, we were in for it. The fields dropped away from us on each side, leaving us as naked to the German batteries as if we were running on a raised causeway. At the bottom of the fields, to our right there was a line of willows, beyond the willows there was the river, and behind the river bank on the further side were the German lines. The grey smoke of their fire was still tangled in the willow tops. Colville drew up under the lee of the last house in the village. He didn't like the look of that open road. Neither did I. Go on, said Viola. What are you stopping for? The guns ceased firing for a moment, and we rushed it. I do wish, said Viola, you'd tuck your arm in, Fernie. It's your right arm, and you're on the wrong side of the car. I asked her what made her think of my right arm just then. Because it's the only part of himself that Jimmy ever thinks of, she said. There was about three quarters of a mile of causeway, and it ended in a little hamlet. And the hamlet, it had been knocked to bits before we got into it, the hamlet ended in a hillock of bricks and mortar. The road to Tsele was completely blocked. Well, said Colville, I am blowed. You've got to take it, said Viola. Sorry, ma'am, it can't be done. You want a motor traction with caterpillar wheels for this business. He was backing the car when a shell burst and buried itself in the place where we had stood. To my horror, I saw that Viola had opened the door of the car and was getting out. What on earth are you doing, I said. I'm going to walk to Tsele. I pulled her back and held her down in her seat by main force. She was horribly strong. And as she struggled with me, she said quietly, It's all right. You two must go back, and I must go to Jimmy. I shouted to Colville, Turn her round, can't you, and get out of this. He turned her. He drew up deftly under the shelter of a barn that still stood intact. Then he spoke. Are you quite sure, sir, that Mr. Jevons is in that place? Because, sir, I heard Kendall say something this morning about their going to Antwerp. Then why the devil didn't you say so? I didn't think of it, sir, until I saw Mrs. Jevons getting out. He added by way of afterthought, Besides, I promised Kendall. You and Mrs. Jevons wasn't to know he was going on to Antwerp. Viola and I looked at each other and burst out laughing. Somewhere behind us, from beyond the river, a gun boomed and we took no notice of it. We went on laughing. He's had us again, she said. Yes, we've been done this time. Well, we'd better scoot. We made a rush for it between guns and got to Bel Air. Once we were out of the village and heading for the Ghent Road, we were safe. We were hardly out of sound of the guns when I heard Viola saying, You know, it really was funny of Jimmy. I said he won't think it quite so funny when he hears what we've done. He didn't think it funny at all. He was furious when he heard what we'd done. He forbade Viola to follow him again. He threatened to sack Colville. He said he'd have me sent home tomorrow and kept there, and Viola should go with me. And when he'd finished, he told us that Antwerp had fallen. And that was how Jevons came to write the story of the fall of Antwerp instead of me. 
Well, he didn't sack Colville, and he didn't get me packed off with the other war correspondents who left Ghent in a body the next day. And he said nothing about sending Viola away. He did better than that. He told her he had brought Charlie Thesiger from Antwerp yesterday, and that her cousin was dying in the Couvent de Saint-Pierre, and that perhaps it would be a bit easier for him if she were with him. We took her to the convent that morning. On the way there, she asked Jimmy why he hadn't told her about Charlie yesterday. He said that up till midnight we weren't absolutely certain that Charlie wouldn't recover, and that she was safer with us in the hotel than she would be away from us in the convent. My safety is to be considered before everything, she said. He answered that it was surely enough for her if he risked it now. I can't think why she didn't see through him. I and Kendall and Colville knew perfectly well that he was taking her to the convent to be safe. I think he argued that if she had poor Charlie to look after, it would keep her quiet, and she would be out of mischief till it was time for the Germans to march into Ghent. So we took her to him. We found him in a little whitewashed cell that one of the sisters had given up to him. He lay under a crucifix on the nun's narrow bed, which was too short for him, so that his naked feet showed through the blankets at the bottom. The naked feet of the Christ pointed downwards to his head. He had been shot through the lungs and was dying of pneumonia, sending out his breath in fierce, rapid jerks. He lay on his side with his back towards us, and his face was hidden from us as we came in. The sister who sat with him made a sign that said, Oh yes, you can come in, all of you. It will make no difference. The cell was so small that Jevons and I had to draw back and let Viola go in by herself. We two stood in the doorway and looked in. After the first glance at the bed, it was enough for me, I looked, I couldn't help looking at Viola. Jevons, I noticed, kept his eyes fixed on the body of the dying man. I heard her catch her breath in a sob before she could have seen him. He had slipped his blankets from his shoulder, and it was the sight of his back, under the half-open hospital shirt which showed the bandages and dressings of his wound, that upset her. His back that might have been any man's back, the innocent back that she had no memory of, that disguised and hid him from her, and made him strange to her and utterly pathetic. And then there was the back of his head, sunk like lead into his pillow. The cropped hair had begun to grow. You could see a little greyish tuft. You wouldn't have known that it was Charlie's head. She went slowly round the bed, taking care not to graze the feet that were stretched out to her. And then she saw him. She saw a deep purplish flush, and glazed eyes that couldn't see her, and a greyish beard pointing on an unshaved jaw, and a mouth half open jerking out its breath. She laid her left hand on his shoulder, and with her right she held the limp hand that hung over the mattress. I heard her say in French, if only he knew me, and the nun, perhaps at the end he will know you. And we left her there with his hand in her right hand and her left hand on his shoulder. She was on her honor to stay with him till the end, but her eyes were fixed on Jevons, and they followed him as he went through the doorway of the cell. The very minute he had left her, Jimmy made his bolt for Lokeren. He said he didn't want me, but I had seen Viola's eyes, and I said it would be safer. If I took Viola's car in Colville, she couldn't follow us. She won't follow us, he said. She can't leave him. We made the first bolt into Lokeren together, and we got out, each with a load of wounded, just as the Germans were coming in. He made his second bolt by himself and secretly, while Colville and I were lunching. We followed and were stopped in a village two miles from Lokeren. A Belgian Red Cross man met us here, and told us that Jevons had got through in spite of them, and they didn't in the least expect him to come back again. He shrugged his shoulders and seemed to be disgusted and annoyed with Jimmy, rather than to admire him. We hung about in that village an interminable time. I do not remember its name, if I ever knew it, but I know and remember every house in it, and every tree in the avenue at the turn of the grey road that led to Lokeren, and even now in my worst dreams, I find myself in the little plantation at the end of the village on the left, where the railway siding is, and where the trains came in loaded with wounded. I am always waiting for Jimmy, and looking for Jimmy, and not finding him. And at one point, I always stumble over Viola's body. I find her lying wounded in a ditch that runs through the plantation. And when I find her, I know that Jimmy is dead. And that frightens me. Jimmy's death, I mean, not Viola's body. 
I take Viola's body as a matter of course. It is an abominable dream. But even that dream is not more astonishing, and it is far less improbable than what I was to see. We were at the end of the village. Colville had drawn our car up in the middle of the street, and I was standing by him when two Belgian soldiers rushed up to us, pointing up the road and shouting to Colville to clear out of the way. I turned. Round the bend of the road where the avenue of trees was, I saw a train of horses and gun carriages careening with a curve, and a battery of Belgian artillery came charging down in full retreat, and now in the middle of the battery, as if he were a part of it and informed it with his energy and speed, and now in front of it as if he led it, and joyous as if he had turned its retreat into a victory, came Jimmy driving his car. The inside of the car was packed with wounded men, and, wedged up against Jimmy and standing on the steps and sitting on the bonnet, and hanging on wherever they could find a foothold and hang, were seven officers and soldiers of the Belgian army. Kendall, bleeding profusely from a flesh wound on his forehead, but otherwise unhurt, sat inside among the wounded. It had been a victory for Jimmy. He had advanced within fifty yards of the German lines. He had picked up two of his wounded from under their sentry's fire, and the rest of the men and the officers he had gathered on his way. We sent them all to Ghent with Colville. Before he left, Kendall implored us just to look at Mr. Jevons's car. Mr. Jevons's car was worth looking at. It had a hole in the back of it, where a bullet had gone clean through and buried itself in the cushions. There were five bullet holes in its hood. Its flank was scraped by a flying fragment of shell, the same that had tilted its right rear splashboard. Inside, its canvas covers and its rubber mat were stained with blood. Drawn up motionless in that village street and stared at, Jimmy's car had something of its old self-conscious air. It looked pleased, and at the same time surprised at itself. And while Jevons was dressing and bandaging his flesh wound for him, an idea struck Kendall and he grinned. Do you remember the time, sir, when you wouldn't let her out if there was a spot of rain? I do, said Jevons. And look at her now, not three weeks. What a life she's had. And when Kendall... He was as pleased as punch with his bandage. When Kendall had climbed into Colville's car, Jimmy turned his round again. Though the officers implored him to come on, for the Germans were on our backs. But Jimmy only jerked his thumb in the direction of Lokeren and made his third bolt. I scrambled in beside him as he started. End of Book 3, Chapter 14, Part 1 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Book Three, Chapter Fourteen, Part Two, of Tasker Jevons: The Real Story by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book Three, His Book, Chapter Fourteen, Part Two. I don't mind saying that I hated this adventure. It was one thing to go into Antwerp when the Germans were so busy storming it that they couldn't attend to you and quite another thing to be alone with Jimmy on that horrid grey road, with the Germans coming every minute round the turn of it. Jimmy explained that there was a wounded man hiding in a ditch about a mile from Lokeren, and he'd got to fetch him. We fetched him, and another carload, without any misadventure. When we got back to our village, we found a field ambulance there. Jimmy said, I believe that's my field ambulance. Presently he gave a start, that made the car swerve as if he had run over a dog. Well, I'm damned if there isn't Viola. Yes, there she was. She had come out with a field ambulance. And it was Jimmy's field ambulance, the one that had been sent out without him. It had come on into Ghent from Antwerp yesterday, and Viola had found it. This is too bad, said Jevons. You ought to be looking after Charlie. Why aren't you looking after him? Charlie, she said, died three hours ago at twelve o'clock. It wasn't five hours since we had left her with him in the nun's cell under the crucifix. I don't think I had realized it before, but now it came over me as a new and strange thing, how little he had mattered. Then it struck me that Jevons must have known it all the time. I've done everything, she said, that had to be done, and I've written to Aunt Mattie and Uncle George and Mildred. Mildred, I wondered. Well, yes. Jevons and I had forgotten Mildred. We had forgotten her engagement to Charlie, though I suppose nobody knew better than we did why it had been broken off. 
to his father and mother and mildred he did matter and perhaps he mattered to viola in a way for she said she would have given anything to have saved him he must have mattered to jevons when he brought him from antwerp and when we buried him in ghent and the cross on his grave reproves me reminding me that to his country he mattered supremely after all after lokeren jevons and i tried to come to terms with viola the conference took place upstairs in their bedroom where we had withdrawn for greater privacy viola sat on the one chair and jimmy and i on the bed jimmy did most of the talking he said look here my dear child if there wasn't a war on i wouldn't stand in the way of your amusement for the world and there's a great deal to be said for you i think you are adorable in a tunic and breeches and general roubaix agrees with me if ferny doesn't we all think you heroic and you are sometimes useful but there isn't a thing you've done that a man can't do better except getting ferny through the lines and nobody wants ferny in the lines and when you're in them you've a moral effect equal to about ten seventeen-inch guns if the men see you hovering round their trenches they're so jumpy they can hardly hold their rifles if kendall sees you he's so jumpy he can hardly steer colville says he'd rather hang himself than go through another day like berlier ferny all but lost his job on the morning standard because he was told off to look after you when he ought to have gone to antwerp he would have lost it if i hadn't done his work for him and you don't make things easier for me good god sometimes i don't know what i'm doing it isn't fair on us it isn't fair it isn't fair on me she said i'm jumpy when i'm kept back you don't know what it's like jimmy don't turn me back and the poor child began to talk about her duty to the wounded and that made him burst out again the wounded if you think you're any more comfort to the wounded than you are to ferny and me i can tell you you're mistaken there was a poor devil at Loker in the other day with a bullet in his stomach who told me he didn't mind his wounds and he didn't mind the germans what worried him was the lady being there when he wasn't able to defend her she tilted her chin at that and said she didn't want anybody to defend her perhaps you don't but what would you think of a man who didn't want to defend you what would you think of ferny and me if we wanted you to be here i should like you to want me she said no my dear child you wouldn't you don't know what you're saying and then he said i know better than you do what you want men aren't made like that if they are men you can't have it both ways and he said something about chivalry that drove her back in sheer self-defence on a feminist line she said that nowadays women had chivalry too and our chivalry is to go down before yours can't you have both not in war time your chivalry is to keep back and not make yourself a danger and a nuisance come she said what about joan of arc and that was too much for jimmy he jumped up off the bed and walked away from her and sat on the table as if it gave him some advantage no no he said i can't stand that rot when you're a saint or i'm a saint you can talk about joan of arc if you want to be joan of arc go and be it with some man who isn't your husband who isn't in love with you perhaps he won't mind go with ferny if you like though it's rather hard on him i said i thought he was rather hard on viola if he'd seen the poor child at berlier flinging herself out of the car and proposing to climb over the ruins of several houses and walk by herself under shell-fire to zele because she thought he was there jimmy looked at her and he did what he had done that night when he saw her coming towards him in the lounge he sighed a long sigh of complicated anguish and satisfaction she heard it and she understood it and she said i can't help it if i am like that you'll have to take the risk of me please go away ferny and i went nora has been reading what i've just written and she tells me that there's a great deal about jimmy's joy and his adventure and all that and not one word about his duty and devotion and self-sacrifice she says i don't give a serious impression of him he might have gone out to the war just for fun and that it isn't fair to him i don't know whether it's fair or not i write as he compels me to write i find that i cannot separate his joy and his adventure from his duty and devotion and self-sacrifice he didn't separate them himself i don't even know that self-sacrifice is really the word for it and the impression he gave me is just that of going out for fun it was the wild humour of his devotion that made it the spectacle it was she has told me that it's all right so long as i recognise that it was devotion 
After Lokeren I had no desire to go through the rest of the war with Jimmy. To be with Jimmy was destruction to your sense of values. I've got it firmly fixed in my head that the taking of Lokeren was an important affair. As for what Jimmy called the tin pot bombardment of Mele, there was nothing wrong with his sense of values. I shall see it insanely for ever and ever as the event of the war. And there is this to be said that Lokeren filled the last gap in the line closing round Ghent, north, south, and east, and drew it tighter. And Mele, only four and a half miles away, was the last point in the German advance on Ghent. The taking of Mele would be a sign to us that the game was up. For three days, Jimmy operated joyously in the village and over the leagues of turnip fields that lay outside it. Of the first two days, I remember an endless tramping over endless furrows that were ditches for the dead, an endless staggering under stretchers that dripped blood, an endless struggling with Viola to keep her under shelter of the walls. Each of these acts seemed to be endless, though one gave place to the other, and it was only the firing that went on all the time, till even Jimmy complained once or twice that he was fed up with it. I remember that Jimmy's field ambulance played a great part in these adventures. I remember feeling a malicious satisfaction in the thought that at the same time it was compelled to witness his performances. It couldn't miss him. I remember all these things, but of Mele itself I remember nothing but the town hall, with its double flight of steps up to its door, and the two tall stone pillars, one on each side of the door, and the Greek pediment above it that and the little old flemish house that stood back by itself on the other side of the road and its white walls and its red tiled roof and the two green poplars in its garden mounting guard the house and its garden and its poplars are always vivid and still they always appear to me as charged with mystery and significance and as connected in some secret way with jimmy's fate in the pauses of our movements the field ambulance and jimmy's car and viola's were always drawn up before the town hall facing the little house then came sunday the eleventh the third day of mele when viola was left behind at ghent jimmy had made her promise on her honour to be brave this time and stay in the hotel and wait for orders colville stayed with her they were to pack our things and be ready to leave at a minute's notice colville had secret orders that if we were not back by midnight he was to take viola on to bruges in his car and wait for us there for we knew now that we were in for it and we knew that the war which was coming closer and closer to the city was coming closer to us it had been charlie thesiger first now it might be reggie at least we knew that reggie's regiment the third blankshires had come up from ostend the day before that it was quartered somewhere between ghent and mele and that it had been engaged at Quatre our own orders were to stick to mele i suppose from the way the ambulances were massed there that the end had been foreseen that afternoon the battle began to sweep round from cataract to mele and on our third journey out a rumour reached us at the barrier where the sentry stood guard it was one of those preposterous rumours that run before disaster and are started god knows how when a retreat begins i think it was the belgian red cross men who spread it for i heard the guide who went with jimmy's field ambulance assuring him seriously that seven thousand british had been surrounded and cut to pieces on the road between cataract and mele to be sure the number diminished with each repetition of the tale dropping from seven thousand to seven hundred and from seven hundred to seventy but in another hour we were bringing in the men of the blankshires and towards the end of the day the real bombardment of mele began and on our last journey out we and jimmy's field ambulance were in the thick of it i can remember nothing of that bombardment but the three shells the first ripped open the roof of the town hall and set fire to it the second struck the greek pediment and brought the whole front toppling into the street then about five minutes after there was the third shell the light was going out of the sky so that we saw the first shell like a sheet of curved lightning making for the village as we approached from the ghent side there was a deadly attraction about the thing that made you feel that it and you were the only objects in god's universe and that you were about to be merged in each other it looked as if it were rushing out of heaven straight for us so that we were surprised when it apparently swerved aside and hit the town hall instead jimmy and i were in the front of the car 
Kendal, whose flesh wound was beginning to worry him, sat behind. A battery of artillery charged past us, followed by the remnants of a French regiment on the run. Jimmy put more speed on. By the time we got into the village, the town hall was spouting flame. Jimmy drew up his car about fifty yards away from it. The field ambulance had turned and took its stand a little further away behind us, under the cover of the opposite walls. Its men began dragging out their stretchers. Kendall and I made ready with ours. The wounded were being brought out of every house they were in. A Belgian colonel rode past us, trying to look unaware that he was retreating. He shouted to us to clear out of it. This was the only sign of interest that he showed. Somebody else came up to Jevons and told him that there were three or four wounded men somewhere inside the town hall, but that the place was on fire and it was absolutely impossible to get them out. He advised us to pick up the men who were lying in the street and clear out. I saw Jevons nod his head as if he agreed and consented. I saw him get out of the car, and then I heard Kendall say, Give us a hand, sir, and I turned to my stretchers. When I looked round again, Jevons was running towards the town hall. The man who had told us to pick up our wounded and clear out was looking after him with a face of the most perfect horror. Kendall and I followed with the stretchers, and we saw Jevons run up the steps of the town hall. He turned at the top of the steps and waved to us to keep back. Then he went through the big doors between the pillars. There was a crash and a roar, as if the whole building had fallen in. It was the top story plunging to the second floor. The upper half of the town hall was like a crate filled with blazing straw. The Greek pediment was the only solid thing that subsisted in that fire. Then the first floor was caught. It burned more slowly. Kendall and I and the ambulance men ran forward with the stretchers, and Jimmy came through the doors carrying a wounded Frenchman. He went in again and came out with another Frenchman. The ground floor had begun to burn behind him. He went in a third time and came out with Reggie Thesiger. He must have had to go further into the hall to find him, for it was a much longer business. We, Kendall and I, were down the street by the ambulance when they came out, and I didn't see that it was Reggie till I heard Kendall say, Sir, that's Major Thesiger he's got. Reggie's arm was round Jimmy's shoulder, and Jimmy's arm was round Reggie's waist. He half carried, half supported him. He came out in the middle of a cloud of smoke that hid him. The smoke was followed by a burst of fire and another crash and roar as the ceiling of the first story plunged to the ground floor. With all this going on behind him, Jevons paused on the top of the steps to readjust his burden to the descent. We heard afterwards that Reggie had said, You'd better leave me, old man, and scoot. You can't do it. It didn't look as if he could. But as we went back to them, we saw that Jevons had heaved Reggie over his shoulder and was carrying him down the steps. He came very carefully and slowly, so that we had reached the town hall before he had staggered to the last step. As we pressed closer to help him, he told us to get back if we didn't want the whole damned place down on the top of us. We gave back and he followed us. I don't know how we got Reggie onto the stretcher. He had a piece of shell somewhere in his thigh. But we did it and ran with him to the ambulance. We had about a minute to do it in and no more. And then the second shell came. It hit the Greek pediment from behind, and we saw the two tall pillars that supported it stagger, snap like two sticks and bend forwards, looking suddenly queer and corpulent in their foreshortening. Then they parted and fell, bringing down the whole front of the town hall. The town hall was spreading itself over the street, with a noise like a ship's coal going down the chute in a thunderstorm, as Reggie's stretcher slid home along its grooves in the ambulance. Kendall and I were inside for a second or two, doing things for Reggie. The engine throbbed. The whole ambulance shook with its throbbing. In that second, Jevons had run back to fetch his car, calling out to us to cut, and he would overtake us. He had cranked up his engine and jumped in before Kendall could get down and go to his help. When we saw him start, we started. There wasn't any time to lose. Kendall and I were sitting on the back step of the ambulance so that we kept him in sight. It was quite certain that he would overtake us. He was running straight down the middle of the road when the third shell came. It burst on the ground behind him, on his right, a little to one side. Some of it must have struck the steering gear. The car plunged to the left. It climbed reeling to the top of a bank and paused there, then fell front over back into the ditch and lay there belly uppermost 
and its wheels whirling in the air jevons lay on his face half in half out of the ditch he lay for about three seconds then as we ran to him we saw him raise himself on his left arm and crawl out of the ditch and when we reached him he was trying to stand and he tried to smile at us you needn't look like that he said i'm as right as rain and then he tried to raise his right arm you saw a khaki cuff horribly stained a red rag hung from it a fringe that dripped reggie opened his eyes and turned his face towards the stretcher that slid into its grooves beside him that isn't jimmy is it he said i saw him move his left hand to find jimmy's right and i heard jimmy saying again in a weak voice this time that he was as right as rain we had got out of the range of the guns and the surgeons had done their business with bandages and splints they had taken reggie first then jimmy and so lying beside reggie on his own stretcher and in his own ambulance he was brought back to ghent the military hospitals were full so we took them to the couvent de saint pierre and i went over to the hotel de la poste to fetch viola i don't know what i said to her i think i must have done what jimmy told me and said they were all right she never said a word till we got to the convent she told me afterwards that when she saw me coming in alone she had been sure that jimmy was killed she didn't know about reggie yet you see this part of it is all confused and horrible we had to wait before we could see our surgeons at the convent the nuns took us into a little parlour and left us there and i told her then what had happened i can see her sitting in the nuns parlour looking out of the window as i told her looking as if she wasn't listening and i can hear my own voice it sounded strange and affected as if i had made it all up and didn't believe what i was telling her he saved reggie's life do you see at the risk of his own at the risk of his own and still she looked as if she wasn't listening it didn't sound as if it had really happened and i feel now as if i had taken hours to tell her then one of our men came to us he drew back when he saw mrs jevons and i followed him to the doorway he said they were busy with major thesiger they hadn't started yet with mr jevons and then ages afterwards one of the surgeons came and called me out of the room he said the major would be all right they'd got the bit of shell out but there was jevons hand they'd have to take it off they couldn't possibly save it and it was going to be a beastly business they'd run out of anaesthetics thesiger had had the last they'd got yes of course it would have been better but jevons wouldn't hear of it he knew they were short and thesiger didn't and he'd insisted on their doing thesiger first it was an awful mistake he said because it would hurt jevons ten times more than it would hurt anybody else he thought that i had better get mrs jevons out of that room the ward where they were operating was next to it i couldn't get her out of it there were five minutes when i sat there and viola crouched on the floor beside me with her face hidden on my knees and her hands grabbing me tighter and tighter and the door opened and i saw two nuns looking in i heard one say to another c'est sa pauvre femme qui devient folle and the door closed on us all that fuss about a hand jimmy had come out of his faint and was trying to restore viola to a sense of proportion if all the rest of him had been blown away he said by that confounded shell and only his hand had been left she might have had something to cry for and yet she cried inconsolably for jimmy's hand god knows what memories came to her when she thought of it i don't think she thought of it as the hand that had written masterpieces and flung them aside that could steer a car straight through hell-fire and that could nurse and bind up wounds i know i thought of all these obvious things but she must have thought of the hand that she knew like her own hand the hand with the firm nervous fingers and the three strong lines in the pinkish palm the hand she adored and had shrunk from whose gesture had been torture to her and whose touch was ecstasy the hand that the surgeons had cut off and tossed into a basket to be cast out with the refuse of the wards not that either of us had much time for thinking of anything but how we could get out of ghent before the germans got into it viola said it would be quite easy there was the ambulance and there was her car and there was jimmy's car i told her that jimmy's godlike car was lying bottom upwards in a ditch between ghent and Mele an object half piteous half obscene she said it was a jolly good thing then that she'd brought hers perhaps it was we had just got jimmy and reggie into their first sleep at six o'clock in the morning when the orders came for us to clear out 
We cleared out in Viola's car with Reggie on his stretcher and Jimmy, propped up with pillows, at his head, and Viola at his feet, and two wounded men in front with Colville, and Kendall and me standing one on each step. Most of our luggage was on the boulevard in front of the convent where we had left it. We went as we had come through Bruges. We drew up to rest in the marketplace under the belfry. You'd better look at it while you can, Viola, said Jevons. You may never see it again. I, I shall never see anything else, she said. We looked at the belfry. It was as if, under that menace of destruction, we saw it for the first time. We might have enjoyed that run back, Viola said. Only somehow we didn't. Reggie was ill from his anaesthetic all the way, and Jimmy's temperature went up with every mile, and we missed the boat at Ostend and had to stay there all night and jimmy became delirious in the night and thought that he had left viola behind in the town hall at mele and there was no room on the morning boat and when we did get on board the naval transport at dunkirk kendall took it into his head to be seasick till he nearly died we had no peace till seven o'clock on tuesday when we got to canterbury end of book three chapter fourteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine Book Three, Chapter Fifteen of Tasker Jevons, The Real Story by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Book Three, His Book, Chapter Fifteen. I think I have said that Jevons made me suffer. He did. I can say that before those three weeks of his, all my contacts with him were infected by the poison of my suffering but all that was nothing to what he made me suffer since what i suffer now when i remember the things i have said of him the things i have thought and felt my furtive belittling of him my unwilling admiration the doubt that i encouraged in the mean hope that it would become a certainty i would give anything to be like the canon or my wife the only two of us whose conscience doesn't reproach them when they see jimmy's right sleeve i remembered nora saying to me once i shall be sorry for you if you don't take care well i am sorry for myself but i am still sorrier for mrs thesiger i know there's a great deal to be said for her i had wired to them from dunkirk to tell them that reggie was slightly wounded but recovering and that the four of us would be in canterbury that evening it wasn't my fault if reggie being a british officer was taken from us at dover and sent to a military hospital but i admit i ought to have wired again to the thesigers to inform them of the fact i ought to have remembered that reggie was more important to mrs thesiger than jevons even if jevons had done what mrs thesiger didn't yet know he'd done the maternal passion is a terrible thing it has made women commit crimes it made my mother-in-law push viola from her on her threshold and turn on me as i was helping jimmy out of the car it made her say you brought my son-in-law what have you done with my son to do her justice she hadn't seen what had happened to jimmy though he was tired and weak he could still stand up and stagger along if you held him tight and the maternal passion is not more terrible than the passion that viola had for jevons it made her say to her mother as the canon and i brought jimmy in the dear old man had seen in an instant why he wore his coat slung loose over his right shoulder you can see what we're doing with my husband and when we were all in the drawing-room and i was explaining gently that reggie was all right but that we'd had to send him to the military hospital it made her say if it wasn't for your son-in-law your son wouldn't be alive god knows what thirst she satisfied what bitterness she exhausted what secret anguish she avenged they were all there the thesiger women they had come you see to meet reggie victoria and millicent and mildred and they heard her but it was mildred who saw she spoke to her mother can't you see she said viola was kneeling by the sofa where her father had made jimmy lie and she had unbuttoned and taken from him his heavy coat she looked at me and said please take them away somewhere and tell them jimmy is so tired i know that must seem awful it was awful to come back from the battlefields of flanders from sieges and sackings and slaughter and see the women flashing fire at each other and they were mother and daughter but you see they were women i know that the war should have purged them of their passions perhaps it did purge them but your lover is your lover and your son your son for all that 
and it wasn't easy for mrs thesiger to see how her son-in-law could have saved her son i am not sure that she wouldn't have thought it presumption in jevons to suppose that he could save anybody let alone her son there were people like the thesigers from whom heroism was expected as a matter of course and there were people like jevons you know what she said about his going to the front when i had finished the tale and i let her have the whole of it from the first shell that hit the town hall to the bit of the third shell that hit jimmy she said you mean that if he hadn't gone back for his car she had broken down and was sobbing quietly but you could see how her mind worked i said i mean that if he hadn't gone back to the town hall to look for reggie he wouldn't have been hit then i told her how they took jimmy's hand off i heard the cannon groan millicent and victoria began to sob as their mother had sobbed mildred set her teeth firmly and mrs thesiger turned to me a queer disordered face and spoke they they gave the anaesthetic to reggie they did i said because jimmy made them yes i am very sorry for mrs thesiger she cried softly and with a great recovery of beauty and dignity for about fifteen seconds the canon had gone back to jevons then she rose and addressed her daughter mildred dear i think jimmy had better have reggie's room then she went to him and i am told that she kissed him for the first time she kissed him as if he had been her son poor jimmy i may say was so tired that he didn't want to be kissed by anybody he still had reggie's room six weeks later when i came back from france for a weekend reggie had recovered and was with them for a fortnight's leave before he went out again nora and i went down on saturday to see him his leave was up on sunday night without reggie i don't think i should have realized jevons in his final phase he had been happy i know at hampstead in the first two years of his marriage he had been happy most of the time in edwards square even in mayfair he had had moments and amershott had been on the whole an improvement on mayfair and he had lived through his three weeks in ghent in a sort of ecstasy and before that all the time there had been his work which i am always forgetting and his fame when he didn't forget it but there had always been something at first it had been the thesigers as long as mrs thesiger as long as one thesiger held out against him he had felt defeat and then there had been reggie's return and his appalling doubt he had pretended not to see his doubt and not to mind it and he had seen it as he saw everything and he had minded awfully then came viola's illness which you could put down to reggie's doubt and after that it had been viola pretty nearly all the time and even at ghent by the tortures of anxiety she had caused him you may say that she had spoiled his ecstasy and now without any effort or any calculation or foresight by a stupendous accident he had found happiness and peace and certainty the thing was so consummately done and so timed to the minute that when you saw him there enjoying it you could have sworn that he had played for it and pulled it off it was as if he had said to himself give me time and i'll bring all these people round even mrs thesiger even reggie i'll make them love me wait and you'll just see how i shall score and there he was scoring and it was as if he had said to himself long ago as for viola i know all about it i know i do things that make the poor child shudder but i can put that all right i can make her forget it i give myself three weeks as if he said she thought she was going to leave me i knew that too and i didn't care she might have left me a thousand times and i should have brought her back i used to think it pathetic that jevons should have wanted mrs thesiger to love him that he should have wanted reggie to but i must say his pathos was avenged they were pathetic now that big hulking major wasn't happy unless he was writing jimmy's letters or cutting up jimmy's meat for him or helping him in and out of his clothes mrs thesiger wasn't happy unless she was doing things for him the canon wasn't happy though like nora he had nothing on his conscience and mildred and millicent and victoria weren't happy nor the thesiger's friends in the cathedral clothes and then after they had made a hero of him for six weeks on that saturday night when we were all together in the canon's library jevons made his confession we had been exchanging reminiscences something had made viola think of jimmy's general and the two colonels at ghent she began telling the canon how we had watched them through the glass screen and how funny general robet had looked with his arm round jimmy's neck and how he had said that jimmy was a salamander and that he didn't know what fear is oh don't i said jimmy 
and that sent Reggie back to the day when he had first seen Jimmy. " Look here, old man. What made you say you were an arrant coward ?"" Because," said Jimmy simply, " I am one. Dear old Roubaix was talking through his hat. Not know what fear is ? I know a good many things, but I don't know anything better than that. You can't tell me anything about fear I don't know. You've no idea how I funked going out to the war. Yes, funked. It wasn't any ordinary funk, mind you. The little creepy feeling in your waist and your tummy tumbling down and your heart sort of fluttering over the place where it used to be. I believe you can get over that. And I never had that, ever, except once when I saw Viola in a place where she'd no business to be. It was something much worse. It, it was in my head, in my brain, a sort of madness. And it never let me alone. It was worse at night. And after I got up and began to go about in the morning, when my brain woke and remembered, but it was there all the time. I saw things, horrors, and I heard them. I saw and heard the whole war, all the blessed time, all those infernal five weeks before I got out to it. I kept seeing horrors and hearing them. There was a lot of detail, realism wasn't in it, and it was all correct, because I verified it afterwards. Things were just like that. Every morning when I got up, I said to myself, I'm going out to that damned war. But I wish to God somebody would come and chloroform me before I get there. There were moments when I could have chloroformed myself. I felt as if it was the utter injustice of God that I, I, had to be mixed up in it. Not know what fear is? Just conceive, said Jimmy, a man living like that in abject, abominable terror in black funk keeping it up all day and half the night for five solid weeks before he got there and when you got there said reggie were you in a funk oh well you see by the time i'd got there it had pretty well worn itself out there wasn't any funk left to be in and when i saw reggie look at him i knew he had scored again still i wondered how it really stood with them and whether reggie had settled with his doubt or whether sometimes when you caught him looking at jimmy it had come over him again the kind of virtue his brother-in-law had displayed in flanders wouldn't help him you see to that particular solution and with the thesigers when they took after their mother things died hard he must have felt that he had to settle it before he went viola told us what happened it was his last evening and the three were together in that room of reggie's he had just said that viola wouldn't care how many town halls he was buried under as long as jimmy didn't go and dig him out and then suddenly he went straight for it jimmy he said did you run away with my sister or didn't you i don't care whether you did or not but did you no i didn't said jimmy then what the dickens reggie said were you doing together in bruges we were looking at the belfry said jimmy and reggie shook his head that's beyond me he said yes said viola but it wasn't beyond jimmy that's the real story of tasker jevons and his wife don't ask me what would have happened to them if there hadn't been a war i tried to show you the sort of man he was he knew his hour even before it found him and you cannot separate him from his hour end of chapter fifteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of tasker jevons the real story by Mason Clare.